Uh, this is the Fresh Market Tomato Production uh, webinar put on by the Small Farms team of the University of Illinois. And um, I have uh, myself and my colleagues, Deborah Grant, Kavanaugh Grant, Mike Rogge, and Dr. Rick Weinsrill, uh, all with the U of I Extension, going to talk with you tonight. And, and glad to have you here. Thank you, Kyle, for the introduction. Uh, Mike Rogge, just a brief history of, of tomato production. Uh, uh, tomatoes are actually native to Central and South America. They were uh, brought over towards to, to the Old World back in the 1500s by Spanish conquistadors uh, to bring back food and other items back to the royalty of, of Spain and, and, and England. They returned to North America during European immigration. And interestingly enough, uh, tomato is, is, is a fruit, botanically speaking, because it does have seeds. and Long story short, if it has seeds, it's a fruit. Well, tomatoes, much like grapes, <clears throat> much like apple, they're all fruits because they do have seeds. And during the 1800s, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, to protect uh, U.S. growers of, of tomatoes, ruled that tomatoes would be a vegetable, as vegetables could be taxed if they were imported into the United States. So we went from being a fruit to a vegetable based upon the U.S. Supreme Court decision of the 1800s. Tomatoes are the most widely grown vegetable in the U.S., or fruit, botanically speaking. And, and many have grown tomatoes in the past. Uh, most every home gardener probably has a tomato plant or two in it. So remember, remember the Solanaceous family, uh, the nightshade family, has its eggplant, pepper, and potatoes as well. Several different types of tomatoes, and these may or may not be entirely accurate, but uh, I think you get the portrait as we, as we talk about these here. Globe tomatoes, uh, the center picture there, nice round tomatoes are the most common. Uh, many home growers are used to celebrity variety tomato. Uh, VHN series is another type of, of globe tomato, Mountain Pride, another one, Mountain Fresh, etc. They're round, global shaped tomatoes. Some of the larger beefsteak varieties, that's a term that's been used by, uh, by vegetable growers to describe uh, the larger types of, of sandwich tomatoes. Those are the tomatoes that when you slice them will probably take up the whole size, whole size of the bread slice you're using it on. Some named varieties you may be familiar with include Big Beef or Brandywine, for instance. Uh, we have many various colors of tomatoes, as a picture in the lower left depicts. And we have other sizes of the tomatoes, too. The cherry or the grape tomatoes, for instance, are smaller than the globe tomatoes. Uh, the aroma tomato, which is mostly a paste tomato, is oblong. So different sizes, different colors of tomatoes. There's two different types of growth habits of tomatoes. There are determinate tomatoes and there are indeterminate tomatoes. And they're mostly described by their vegetative growth, determinate being shorter. Uh, there's a more concentrated harvest period with tom determinate tomatoes. Uh, they're determined because their vegetative growth slows as the plants begin to flower. Some varieties like Celebrity, you may be familiar with, are determinate tomatoes. Indeterminate tomatoes, on the other hand, continue to grow after they start flowering. A branching will continue throughout the season. Most home gardeners are using indeterminate types of tomatoes, such as Early Girl or, or Better Boy. We often set out transplants in a field. Rarely will we plant tomato seed in a field. A seed is planted in cells and allowed to grow in a hothouse or a greenhouse until it gets to transplant size and it's set out in the field. Tonight we're going to talk about planting, fertility, water management, pest management, training, and marketing. The uh, planting tomato, as we all realize, is a tomatoes are a warm season crop. They, they originate in the tropics, so they do like warm weather, uh, but not too warm. As too high temperatures can be detrimental to, to flowering. Uh, flowers will abort if temperatures too much higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And they'll also abort at lower temperatures as well. Uh, 50 degrees can negatively impact flowering of tomatoes. So we want to make sure we're planting tomatoes when all threat of frost has disappeared. Um, many commercial growers have utilized black plastic as a resource to do several things. And black plastic mulch placed on the ground allows soil to warm up much faster. Uh, 
because that warmth of the sun will transfer down to the soil, warming that, that soil, which allows for earlier growth of tomatoes. Also con conserves moisture and leaves a little bit of cleaner fruit because we're not getting uh, rain splashed soil onto the fruit of the tomato. So black plastic mulch has allowed many commercial growers to increase their planting date, as has high tunnels. Uh, many commercial growers now uh, would rather grow tomatoes in a high tunnel than outside simply because of the quality can be ensured to be a much higher quality inside a high tunnel. And as a reminder, <clears throat> the picture in the lower right hand corner there, what happens to, what can happen to tomatoes during uh, cold weather can be what the term called cat facing, where the flowers are infused during cold weather. Uh, we call that cat facing and can occur during the during cold times, during the formation and early flowering of the tomato. Uh, growing transplants, real briefly, we're going to talk about that. Uh, again, rarely are, are tomato plants directly seeded in the garden, but they're planted in, in transplant trays or grown in cells. Uh, matter of fact, uh, that's going on currently. There are commercial growers who grow tomatoes in tunnels or have started to, to trans, or started seeds in transplant cells uh, this week or, or last week or next week. Now's the time for you to be doing that. Good sunlight is helpful as well as bottom heat. Uh, tomatoes like 75 degree temperatures to germ, and bottom heat help. Bottom heat helps provide that. Larger transplants, as they're transplanted to a field, in larger cells usually equal earlier yield of tomatoes. So. Uh, the minimum transplant size for most growers is a two-inch cell. Some use a three-inch cell, and some have tried to increase earlier production by going up to a four, perhaps even a five-inch cell size. Uh, plant spacings for different types of uh, field versus high tunnel spacing. And these are suggested plant spacings, but uh, for determinate tomatoes, again, determinate tomatoes are going to be lower in growth. They're not going to be as branching as what indeterminates are, so we can squeeze those rows down just slightly and reduce in row spacing slightly as well to get more tomatoes per volume of, of soil. In the field, the determinate rows will, can, can go as low as four foot to five foot. Some of this could depend upon <clears throat> your equipment that you're using in the field, how much space you need between the rows, etc. Uh, in row spacing, 18 to 24 inches with determinants. You know, with indeterminates, because they're going to branch a little bit more, we need to go with a wider row spacing. In the tunnel, <coughs> we have different spacings because we're looking at a higher productive environment in the tunnel. There are some producers who are, and, and mostly in tunnels, we're growing determinate tomatoes. There are some indeterminates growing in greenhouses, but most high tunnels we utilize a determinate tomato. Some growers are going down to a two-foot spacing uh, between rows in a tunnel. And that, that's pretty tight. Uh, you've got to be able to get your equipment through these rows. You've got to be able to walk down the rows to be able to pick as well. So two foots are rather tight spacing. A three-foot could get fairly tight if when the tomatoes get some size to them. So again, these are suggested row spacings. Uh, three foot for determinate. 18 inch between plant spacing is fairly common in a high tunnel. We can stack these plants pretty densely in the tunnel because we can supply the necessary water and nutrients to the drip irrigation system. Uh, indeterminates in a high tunnel, again, it's going to depend upon if you're pruning heavily or not. Now, most of the indeterminates in a tunnel or a greenhouse are probably looking at a central leader, so you can keep that row spacing down. And row spacing within, between plants, can be narrowed as well with this that type of a planting system. Tomato is a self-pollinating crop. Uh, in the field, it's, 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 it will self-pollinate because uh, there's enough wind generally to allow that to occur. In a high tunnel, because of the closed, semi-closed structure, some producers are utilizing bumblebees in a high tunnel to help pollinate uh, those flowers. Bumblebee, or excuse me, honeybees are, are not really well adapted to a high tunnel. Bumblebees are better adapted to a high tunnel. Uh, pruning, uh, although you may get lower yields overall with pruning, pruning does allow earlier yields of larger fruit. So many growers do prune, and we'll, we'll talk about pruning here towards the end of the program. Nutrition is highly important for a tomato plant. 
Uh, we can't stress the importance of nutrition. It starts off with a soil test. Uh, obviously, it's necessary. A pH would be the first thing you want to test, and, and uh, we want to make sure we get a pH of between 6.2 and 6.5. You want a phosphorus test of 40 pounds per acre or higher, and a potassium test of 400 pounds or higher per acre as well. The two critical elements are potassium and nitrogen. Uh, for the nitrogen schedule, you want to try to apply 40, maybe 50 percent of the total N, the total nitrogen, before planting. Now, the rest should be applied in the drip irrigation system. And we'd like to, to uh, provide nutrition on at least a weekly basis to tomatoes. Uh, just think of it, would you rather eat one meal a week or would you rather eat a meal every three times a day? Same thing for the tomato plant. Uh, if we store too many nutrients in the soil, uh, we get too much rain, we can leach those nutrients out of the soil profile. So the more regimented of a nutritional program we can give to tomatoes, the better and more happier they're going to grow. Suggested nitrogen and potassium uh, for tomatoes. Uh, again, this is from Lewis Jett from the University of Missouri, who used to be with the University of Missouri. He's suggesting to increase both the nitrogen and the potassium as the plants get more mature. And you can see as we approach uh, 70 plus days after transplant, when our <coughs> when our when our tomatoes are and fruiting, uh, we need higher levels of nitrogen and potassium. You can also see that uh, potassium is needed at twice the rate that nitrogen is on a per acre basis. <coughs> so keep that in mind. Potassium is is a very necessary nutrient in tomato production. Just remember this uh, as we go to the next slide. At 70 plus days after transplant, we want about eight pounds of nitrogen per acre. Well, let's convert that over to more usable uh, when we're looking at smaller uh, geographical areas of, of planting tomatoes. <clears throat> and this looks at the number of ounces of material per thousand square feet to further refine these nitrogen and potassium recommendations. Now we said in the slide, the last slide, we wanted eight pounds per acre of nitrogen at, at 71 days after transplanting. So look down at the line where it says eight pounds per acre. That means we need 2.9 ounces of nitrogen per thousand square feet. If we're using a 15% nitrogen product or a 20% nitrogen product or a 4% nitrogen product, we can determine how many ounces we need per thousand square feet based upon that uh, analysis of the fertilizer. So this is a guide to help direct you on fertilizing nitrogen and potassium for the tomatoes. <clears throat> like I said, we like to use irrigation, and Kyle's going to cover that fairly shortly, to provide water for our tomato plants. It makes a perfect conduit for providing supplemental nitrogen and potassium as well. Uh, using fertilizer injectors into our trickle system or our drip tape system. These are just several different types of trickle, or excuse me, fertilizer injectors to use with your trickle system. They don't have to be complicated. The one on the lower right, for instance, is simply hooked up between the hose and your outside hydrant. And it basically it's a venturi system, which as the water passes through that injector, will suck up nutrient from the five gallon bucket to allow that to be mixed thoroughly in the hose that goes to the uh, tomatoes. And there's other types of injectors here as well, as you can see. Uh, this is one sign of extreme potassium deficiency that can occur in tomatoes. It leads to unripening of fruit. Uh, you can see in the lower left-hand corner a, a phenomenon called yellow shoulder. And we see in the top photos here where the, where the tomatoes never do ripen correctly. You'll never get rid of that green in the right tomato. So potassium is a necessary nutrient. It's highly needed in, uh, in tomato production. And Kyle, I guess that leads us to you. Mike covered some of the basics for us. And uh, 
what I want to cover now is talk a little more in depth about irrigation. Uh, and, and the reason for this is tomato plants are basically about, you know, the tomato fruit is basically about 95% water. So when you think about that, you know, that just shows you how critical that, that water is for that crop in order to have a decent crop and a, and a good high quality crop. So what are the other things we know about it? Well, tomatoes are long season. You know, they grow a long time. Mike that was just talking with you has a number of high tunnels and I remember him talking about uh, they had uh, tomatoes, I think, this year on uh, uh, Thanksgiving Day. So, you know, those plants are out there a long time. They're relatively shallow rooted and they have higher water requirements, like I said, being, you know, that fruit being 95% water. And in most years, you know, we're not going to get enough rainfall for that uh, to have the optimum productivity on that plant and then the optimum quality too. So if you're going to get into the market side of this, um, basically what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to uh, uh, be supplementing that water. So when I say, you know, they need sufficient water, what do I mean by that? Well, obviously the picture on the left um, shows way too much water uh, out there. Those plants aren't going to do well at all. But then on the right, you know, you're not getting nearly enough or it may not uh, be a case of not enough, but maybe not at the right time. So this is kind of a busy slide here, but the one thing that I want you to get from it is that as you look at this graph, basically with the water needs of the plant, one of the two of the things we're going to be concerned about is evaporation and, and transpiration and, and simply in a simple way to look at it, evaporation is, you know, the water loss from the soil and transpiration is the water loss from the plant. And what this graph shows us is that that will vary over the growing season. So as a grower, you have to be very aware of what's going on out, on, out there in the environment and the growing conditions for the uh, tomatoes so that you can um, uh, so that you can water, you know, accordingly. And uh, I'll get to that question here in a minute about grafted tomatoes because uh, I have quite a bit of experience with those. So we know that evaporation, transpiration, and, and what rainfall, what have you, are sporadic over the year. Uh, looking at this graph here, and this is out of the University of Missouri. So you know, in, in practical terms, what does that mean? What does that mean? So. You can see that from fruit set on, you know, which happens about seven weeks, you know, after transplanting, that the water use of that plant is really going to be uh, increasing uh, significantly. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, you can go, it's almost a 500% increase from earlier in the, in the growing season. So the plant does need water early on, and you've got to uh, get those transplants started right. But from uh, uh, basically uh, fruit set on is when you're going to use most of, most of your water. Okay, so what this graph has here is, is basically what, what we're talking about is why, you know, from a market standpoint, why you need to have an, a supplemental irrigation system out there. And, and basically on the left side of each one of these bars is the, uh, and I'm colorblind, so I'm going to do my best here, blue and red on the left-hand side, those are basically non-irrigated yields of, of uh, tomatoes in, in tons per hectare. And on the right side, which purple, and I'm going to call that green, I think I'm good there, is the irrigated uh, total yield and marketable yield. And you can see there's significantly more, you know, uh, consistently over the years from those irrigated uh, fields that they're getting more of a product and more of a marketable product, which is in the end what you're worried about. And the thing that's interesting on the right-hand side, that dry year effect, you can really see, you know, that was over 50%. Uh, an increase in marketable yield, uh, well over 50% of marketable yield from those irrigated crops. And uh, I'll just catch up to a question here from Gene about uh, grafted tomatoes. Uh, grafted tomatoes really don't, there's no difference in grafted tomatoes in water, in terms of water use. That's more uh, from a disease standpoint, uh, you're going to be using those. Um, but in terms of water use, there's really not, other than once you get them grafted and you get them transplanted, there's not much difference in the need, in uh, the water use of those versus ungrafted. So we'll keep moving here. So what are the some of the factors that we have to consider, you know, when we get into uh, deciding what our irrigation schedule is going to be? You know, basically the soil, what type of soil we have, you know, the plant itself, what is the climate out there, and what are some of the management things that we're doing? Okay. I've got a quick one thing here, bear with me. Okay. 
Uh, okay, soils, first thing. And probably many of you have seen this chart on the right hand, bottom right hand side before that uh, soil is, is basically made of sand, silt, and clay. And uh, all soils are different. And the amount of water uh, that they can hold uh, is going to be uh, uh, different for each of the soils. So you've got to have a real good idea what type of soil that you have. Okay, so the water holding capacity is basically what I was referring to was, you know, the amount of that water that's held in the soil in the root zone for that uh, crop, which we're talking about tomatoes tonight, to be able to utilize to grow, you know, before it becomes wilted. And that permanent wilting point is the point basically where there doesn't allow any oxygen in the soil and you have trouble. So the bottom line there is know your soils. And the way you do that is uh, you can go online, actually, to the Web Soil Survey from uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Just Google Web Soil Survey. And you can actually bring up your probably your backyard or your farm, certainly, uh, on that and learn what your soils are. So soil texture, you know, I was talking about the chart earlier. And so you can see here that you have like a, a, a large particles in your soil, like a sand. Uh, it's not going to hold much water. The water is going to go right down through those particles. So it's not going to have much water holding capacity. You're going to be watering more in a sandy type soil than you are in the soil on the left, which is like a loam or a, a silty loam, uh, where the, the soil particles are a little closer together, has a, a, a little higher uh, water holding capacity, just another reason that you want to know what type, type of soil that you're growing uh, your tomatoes out in there. Okay, This is just a real quick uh, look at what I was talking about in a, in a graph, in a table form. You can see that the water holding capacity is, say, a silty clay loam, which is, is a, a lot of the soils that we have uh, here in especially probably two-thirds of Illinois. You know, it has a pretty high water holding capacity in terms of inches per foot than some of the, the coarser sand type soils that we would have uh, uh, around Illinois. So the sandier soils, you're going to be irrigating much more. I mentioned plant factors, okay, what, what are some of those there? Well, rooting depth, you know, it's like I said, mentioned earlier, it's a relatively shallow rooted plant. Um, the growth stage, as I talked about a little earlier on, you're not going to need, uh, once your transplants are growing up into fruit set, it's not going to use a huge amount of water, but certainly has to have a sufficient amount uh, to grow. And then um, you have to get an eye of how much water you can deplete from the soil before you need to be irrigating again. And bear in mind, uh, when we're all teaching tonight, you know, we don't know if a lot of you are growing in high tunnels uh, or, or field tomatoes. We, we kind of have to split the middle here when we talk to groups like this. But certainly, you're going you're gonna to have, have complete control in a high tunnel over a lot of these factors, management factors that you have compared to, uh, you know, uh, adjusting your irrigation rates for rainfall and things like that. Okay, rooting depth, talked about that, uh, relatively shallow rooted, uh, although some roots can go, you know, two feet in depth. So what we're wanting to do is get as much of that water in those upper roots, you know, as possible, and that's why we're going to be using uh, certainly uh, in most situations a, a drip tape uh, type situation to get the uh, water right to the roots that we want, uh, want them to be at. Okay, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So. When is the peak water use? Uh, it basically, the peak water use for that plant is going to be during fruit set and, and fruit development. Okay, and everybody, if you look online here, Dr. Weinsworth, I'll put the uh, the Web Soil Survey uh, URL in there, and I really encourage you to do that. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Um, so. Why is this critical? Well, you know, I talked about the tomato plant being 95% or the, the fruit being 95% water. Um, those plants are going to grow, you know, very, very rapidly. So if you have a, a product that's going to be 95% water and the, the growth spurt that it takes is going to be very quick, um, you need a regular and adequate supply of water during these time periods or what do you end up with? Well, poor fruit set is a stressor of the plant. And any time a plant is stressed, be it an apple, tomato, whatever, uh, you're going to have poor fruit stress, fruit set, and then you can get blossom end rot, which I'm sure probably there's not a person online tonight that hasn't seen this type of uh, situation in, in their tomatoes. Okay, so this is just a, another example uh, I kind of wanted to get graphically of, you know, for, for yield and quality and, and tomato water use in a day. And, and you can read that. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. But you can see from, from, 
flowering and fruit set all the way up to fruit development, um, uh, that's when your, your water use per day is going to be the highest. And actually, I did, I did some math on this uh, a little earlier today. And uh, I figured up in a, in a uh, high tunnel situation uh, with uh, 300 plants in there uh, and in fruit development, uh, you could possibly go through about 1,000 gallons of water a week. So that just gives you an idea about how much water that plant is going to need to, to have a high quality uh, product with, with a, a good yield. Okay. We commonly get uh, asked this question, how much water do my tomatoes use? Well, you can see one gallon, a mature tomato crop can use one gallon of water per plant per day when solar radiation is high. And uh, a lot of times, um, um, it's going to be a little different, obviously, in, in a high tunnel versus outside. There's going to be some nuances with there. But regardless, that mature tomato crop that has a good fruit set is going to be using a lot of water you know, every day. And what you want to get used to is doing water budgeting so that you know um, you know how many plants you have out there. You have a relatively good idea of uh, uh, what stage of maturity they're in and how much water they're going to be using. So you need to uh, really be very consistent and, and very diligent about providing that amount of water on a regular basis for that plant. Okay? I mentioned in this screen that consistency is a is a uh, is a real uh, uh, is really something to strive for, and and here again, I'm willing to bet that you know someone has seen this type of water stress that we have in this picture here uh, with the cracking, uh, because uh, actually we saw that here in Western Illinois a lot last year because we had an extremely dry period as plants were getting mature, and then we got a significant rain out of that uh, that came up from the hurricane there in August. And those plants took on water so quickly that, I mean, literally, it just seemed like they were exploding. You know, they were taking on water, so much water, so quickly that we had trouble. So your consistency of watering will help with that a lot. Okay? I just want to mention quickly about soil water depletion. And uh, uh, that's what I was talking about. You don't, uh, soil water depletion is basically the percent, you know, of available water that you can take out of the soil without causing any trouble. Uh, for the plant. So, you know, for tomatoes, that's about 50%. So if you thought about it, you know, a cup half full or half empty, you never want that cup to be any more than half empty or else you start having issues with the crop. Once again, consistency is the, is the key to, uh, to managing soil water depletion. Uh, let's talk a little bit about climate, and uh, you're all probably very well versed in that. You know, if you're growing field tomatoes, uh, undoubtedly you do have a drip system out there, but, you know, you can take advantage, full advantage of the rainfall that you get out there. You know, if you get a, uh, a good consistent range, you're not going to be near irrigating nearly as much out there, but uh, in a high tunnel, you're in complete control over that. So that's something to consider. Solar radiation. Um, you know, I talked earlier about transpiration and, and loss of water from the plant. That can be extremely high uh, in the middle of the summer uh, when, when it's very hot out there. So um, those sunny days, you're, that plant's going to use and lose a lot of water. Air temperature, obviously, the hotter it is, the more respiration the plant's going through, the more water it's going to use. Wind, um, you know, that can dry out a plant very, very quickly. Uh, so uh, if you have long periods of very windy weather, your plants are going to look, look uh, you know, like they've really uh, been run through the ringer, and, and wind can cause them to use a lot of water. And relative to humidity, if you get the situation where you have high temperatures and uh, high and low relative humidity, your plants are going to going to use a lot of water. Okay. When when do I irrigate? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can you can begin to manage that, and and there's there's good ways and there's bad ways. Uh, there's the 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 age old field test to see if it feels dry enough to irrigate or moist enough, and that basically consists of grabbing some soil from the ground there and and rolling it around between your index finger and your thumb and, and getting an idea: does it crumble apart? Does it stick together? Uh, it's very cheap, you know. You always have that uh, measurement tool. Uh, with you, uh, but it's not very accurate. Unless you've been a grower for a long, long time, uh, you might really have struggles getting the right uh, time to irrigate. Uh, the better is a soil tensiometer, and I'm going to uh, show you how that measures uh, soil moisture. And then uh, water budgeting, okay? Um, 
I just got a note to Mike. Mike, don't worry, it shows twice as many slides. We're good. Okay, and then water budgeting. Uh, this is a soil tensiometer, and basically uh, what that is, it's got a ceramic tip on it, and it is it has a gauge on there that you read. And uh, uh, if you buy one of these and and use them to manage your uh, moisture or, or when to irrigate, you have to follow the label directions on that as as closely as you can because you have to prepare the tip on these and. Um, uh, if it's not prepared correctly, then you uh, it'll give you a false reading. And basically, what that tip does, it measures you know how much the water, how much water is pulled out of that uh, uh, measurement tool, and gives you an idea of how much water is being used by the plant. Uh, so I would rec I recommend all the growers I work with to use these uh, religiously, and uh, they're very easy to set up and use, and and you'll get a much more consistent watering and, and be a lot happier with that. Okay. So what are um, the uh, irrigation system components? Uh, you've got drip lines, which is basically this, the line, the plastic line that goes down through the row, and it's got uh, holes in it, basically emitters uh, every so many inches that let water out. You've got a pressure reducer because you have to reduce the line from the main pressure at your uh, well head or your house. A filter to clean out everything so your drip lines don't get plugged. Fertilizer distribution, which Mike talked about a little bit earlier, and then mulch. Uh, you need to be mulching, you know, these plants so you don't uh, all that water that you're putting out there doesn't get evaporated. And then uh, the various plumbing components. And if you've ever done plumbing, you'll realize that you'll never have exactly what you need on hand at the time. So you're going to make a lot of trips to the store. And this is just kind of a example of what this looks like when uh, when you're going through here uh, setting up a system and, and uh, uh, how it looks. But uh, when you buy these systems, um, you can buy complete sets and basically you just plumb right into it uh, after you have a backflow preventer so nothing goes back to your house or your well. And the, set, the systems would be the best way to go probably to set up your uh, irrigation system on here. So that's an example of that one. Drip line, you can see a picture of it here, is uh, um, you can buy it at very diff different sizes to handle so much different uh, uh, capacities of water use and um, just read your catalogs about that. It's usually 8 to 10 mil thickness. You bury it, uh, you don't lay it on the top, you bury it 1 to 2 inches deep and then uh, usually it's one, you'll ask, if you ask 10 people you get 10 answers as to do you use one line or two lines and that's kind of you know the rule of thumb is one line but there's a lot of people that use two lines you just have to kind of see what works best for you but there are different flow rates uh, most people are using a medium flow tape a half gallon per minute uh, per hundred gallon and uh, once again this comes from Lewis Jett if you ever want to know anything about raising tomatoes uh, Lewis Jett who was with the University of Missouri I think he's at Virginia now uh, is the, I would say, the national expert on it. And just one last slide for me is, um, you know, even with all this plumbing and, and everything else that I showed you here tonight, is that, uh, you know, make sure that you're doing everything else right because irrigation won't make up for anything else that's done wrong. You know, so make sure you're doing the things, planting the varieties that, that Mike talked about, correct. Uh, plant populations, control the weed diseases and insects, and maintain that proper fertility on there. Okay, so that's my section. Uh, I think uh, Rick Weinsrill is up next, and we're going to jump right into Rick. There's an awful lot of things to cover in insect and disease management. I'm going to give you a few examples and some references more than try to cover everything in a few minutes. So if you look at the list of uh, insects and related things on the slide right now, I'll cover tomato hornworm, corn earworm, and stink bugs, and I'll leave it to you to Google and look in some references for general information about the others. One good site for uh, tomato insect pests is the Clemson University site that's on this slide. So Kyle, next slide please. Um, let's do tomato hornworm first. It's the one that everybody uh, knows. This is one that is is uh, that does overwinter here, meaning it survives our winters. Uh, it survives in the pupal stage. The adults fly in late spring and lay eggs, and there's just one generation per year. Um, in general, if you see larvae on plants, a threshold used in commercial production would be one larva per one or two plants. Uh, the thing is, you're 
you best find those when they are small, because if you find them when they're four inches long, they've already done a lot of damage. Uh, this is an insect that feeds on, on leaves, petioles, stems, and on fruit. And you see the fruit damage in the lower slide. Uh, oftentimes, you will see hornworms that are parasitized. And that's what's in the right-hand slide. Those are all the pupal stages of a little tiny parasitic wasp. There are lots of insecticides that control this, but this is one that for organic growers is easier than many to control because BT products, the bacterial insecticides, work well against it. So does Entrust. And so for the people who use other pesticides, do all the pyrethroids and a few other products. It's easily controlled. You just have to see it. Next slide. Then there's one that's not so easy to control and not so easily seen in advance. This is corn earworm. And it has two official names. Another one is tomato fruit worm. Uh, the larvae feed on the fruits of lots of crops, including uh, sweet corn, peppers, tomatoes, green beans. And you see the damage here where the larva has tunneled into the fruit. Now, these feed a little bit on the outside of plants, uh, on leaves and on the surface. But their damage is because they enter the fruits. Next slide. This insect really does not winter well here. In some areas near St. Louis, some areas near um, uh, Havana along the Illinois River, it does. But most of them migrate in on weather fronts. And that may seem a little strange, but it does indeed happen. And the only way we know when they will occur each year is by putting out traps. And the pheromone trap for this insect is shown in the picture. Uh, there is a lure that contains the chemical that emails use to attract males. It's at the bottom of the trap. The males fly in, fly up in a little spiral, and get caught in the top. If you catch more than five or 10 moths per trap per night, that's enough to warrant sprays, especially if there is uh, no field corn silking, because that's where they actually prefer to lay their eggs is on the silks of corn. And when I finish here, I'll put up a link to the supplier of these traps, or a phone number and address, and a supplier of the lures. It can be controlled, and in fact, is a little easier to control in tomatoes than in corn, because it feeds on the surface a little bit. In corn, it goes down the silk channel before it starts to feed. There are a number of insecticides out there. And again, for tomato growers, and trust and the BT products work well. And so you can grow them, grow tomatoes organically and still control this insect. Next slide. Unfortunately, then there are the ones that are hard to control, uh, organic or otherwise, and that's the stink bugs. Uh, I show a picture of brown stink bug on top and a green stink bug nymph, or immature stage on, the stage on the bottom. Oftentimes, when soybeans dry down in late summer, these move from beans into onto anything else, including your tomatoes. But they aren't all that easy to see, because as you approach and disturb plants, they drop to the ground. So sometimes holding a little tray underneath plants and shaking them is a way to detect stink bugs before you see all their damage. Next slide. Damage in tomatoes occurs where the stink bug inserts its feeding stylet. It doesn't chew on plants. It sticks a little needle-like stylet in. And it kills the cells around the spot where it feeds. So it's corky or pithy underneath those. Um, and they're really not very well controlled by anything except the pyrethroid insecticides and endosulfan, which is not long for market. It will be canceled soon. So the commercial products are listed here. For a home gardener, it would be the uh, generic products that contain permethrin. That includes one called 8 and one called just plain permethrin. Next slide. Um, so the insects are things that are sort of quick to describe. And I gave you a few examples. When we look at the diseases of tomatoes, uh, you need to realize that they may be caused by various things. And the fungi and bacteria can be controlled in part by sprays. The viruses and the nutrient deficiencies cannot. So some fungal diseases in tomatoes are septoria, anthracnose, late blight and early blight, uh, verticillium wilt, and a leaf mold. Uh, bacterial diseases are spot, speck, and bacterial canker. The viral diseases include cucumber mosaic virus. And as we go further south, and especially southeast in the state, 
tomato spotted wilt virus. Those are transmitted by aphids and by thrips. And then nutrient deficiencies are blossom end rot, but in fact you manage the nutrient deficiency by more consistent irrigation. Next slide. Instead of trying to cover all of these in a very short time, I'm going to suggest that there are a couple of very good references about tomato or on tomato diseases. One is the Vegetable MD online site for tomatoes from Cornell University, and I put the link at the bottom of this slide. And again, I understand that all these will be these webinars are archived, so later you'll get a link to this and you'll be able to find that. But if you tried tomato disease uh, identification key and said Cornell, you would pick it up. But some examples there, late blight is the tomato in the upper left, anthracnose in the upper right, septoria in the bottom right, those are all fungus diseases, and then tomato spotted wilt virus symptoms on the fruit itself in the lower left. Next slide. Another somewhat more regional publication that's also very valuable in terms of disease identification is this one from, Ohio, from Iowa State University, just Tomato Diseases and Disorders. And if you type that title and said Iowa State, you'd probably be able to find it or wait for the link in the archive. And it shows uh, uh, septoria symptoms on the right, and then the picture on the left is bacterial speck and bacterial spot. Next slide. Without trying to go through each of these individually, one of the things you want to do for disease management is to select varieties that are resistant where they are available. So when you buy seed to transplant or to grow your own transplants, you might look for the disease resistance codes on them. V means verticillium wilt, F for fusarium, N for uh, nematodes, and T for uh, tomato spotted wilt virus, but especially for you, verticillium and fusarium, two soil-borne diseases. Uh, you always use disease-free seed or transplant, so if you are a seed saver, make sure you're careful to follow the directions about not saving seed that carries the disease to the next year. A three or four year crop rotation helps to limit the soil borne diseases. Uh, good plant spacing that gives some air circulation allows leaves to dry off faster and reduce the amount of infection that occurs or, or prevent some infection. Uh, chlorine washing of stakes and cages if they're to be reused from year to year is really important. Um, you always stake or cage tomatoes to keep them upright, and you might use mulch underneath them to try to reduce uh, rain splash from soil. Trickle instead of overhead irrigation. Uh, you don't walk fields to pick or uh, scout them for diseases, monitor them for diseases uh, when the foliage is wet, because you manage to carry particularly bacterial pathogens along with you as you do it. And then as you become a commercial grower with these, you're going to use some fungicides according to labels and references. Uh, at the end of the year, you always try to remove or incorporate plant debris after harvest to, to prevent uh, that, that inoculum from reaching plants the following year. Next slide. What are some guides or references for these? The 2013 Midwest Vegetable Production Guide has a lot of production and pest management information and especially listing, listings of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Um, this is available for free online at the link that's shown here, or you can on that site, uh, or you can Google the same name and purchase it. Pest Management for the Home Landscape is a publication you can buy if you're not really yet a commercial producer. That one's available from the Publications Office at the University of Illinois. We do a newsletter called the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News. You can check that link or simply Google Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News. If you'd like to subscribe to the online version, you get an email every time a new issue is posted. And Purdue does a wonderful vegetable crops newsletter. Uh, even though they're not in Illinois, it's still a great newsletter. And in terms of insight, Remember I showed you a couple of references to guides for plant diseases. A really good one for insects uh, that you have to purchase is Garden Insects of North America by Whitney Cranshaw. It's several hundred pages, tons of color pictures, and it costs only a whopping $29.95. So it's a great reference, uh, and I think you'd find it well worth your while to, to purchase it. So that would be my quick introduction to plant disease and insect management, and I think you have to look for some references to follow up.
Thank you, Rick. We appreciate the comments on the insects and disease control. We're going to spend just a few minutes here talking about pruning and, and training tomatoes because I think, uh, as you all agree, uh, many many homeowners prune and stake tomatoes, and, and almost every commercial grower I know does the same. And, and there's reasons for that. Uh, pruning will provide, as we talked about earlier, higher earlier yields and larger fruit set. Uh, reducing that excess foliage also means, as Rick mentioned earlier, reducing disease susceptibility. Plus, it opens that plant up to easier picking and easier pest control as well. <clears throat> if we don't prune, each sucker will form an individual stem. We can get a massive plant if we allow that to happen. So we need to be looking seriously at, at pruning tomatoes to increase production. <clears throat> and different varieties will, will differ on their need for and, and, and level of pruning. So uh, personal experience is probably good in this case. Um, and we're going to offer suggested guidelines, but again, it's going to depend upon the vigor of the tomatoes, how excessively they need to be pruned. For determinate tomatoes, <clears throat> uh, regardless if they're inside a tunnel or outside, the recommendation is to remove all suckers at first flowering. You can see in the example on the lower right hand corner there, a, a tomato plant. And we can see the flowers on, on two nodes. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is remove all the suckers up to that first flower. And what is a sucker? A sucker is a vegetative growth that occurs at the leaf axle. So looking at this tomato plant in the, in the pictorial here, <clears throat> on the right hand side we see a leaf axle growing horizontally and that first red circle is at the base of that sucker. The sucker again is that vegetative growth that occurs between the stem and the leaf axle. If we allow that to grow it's going to form another stem which means increased flowering and increased production. So we try to limit the amount of production on tomato to make sure we get uniform increased sizing. So again, at first flowering, we remove all the suckers on determined tomatoes below that first flower, <clears throat> including the basal suckers. And this may be a one-time event, but it's probably good as we're going through the season just to monitor these plants to make sure they're not, uh, other suckers are not in, in emerged in causing problems, so it may be something you want to look at season long. <clears throat> indeterminate tomatoes, again, it's going to depend on how we're growing those indeterminate tomatoes and the vigor of those indeterminate tomatoes. In a high tunnel or a greenhouse, oftentimes indeterminate tomatoes are grown as a single liter. Every uh, uh, sucker is pruned off of that and we'll get a liter maybe 15, 20 foot in, in length. So it's a special system that's been designed for indeterminate tomatoes in high tunnels and greenhouses that allows them to do that. <coughs> in the field for indeterminate tomatoes, oftentimes we'll uh, provide a little excess of suckering as compared to the de determinate tomatoes. And when you look at the pictorial here in the lower right hand corner of the slide, you'll notice we're picking off all the suckers up to the second set of flower clusters. But again, it's going, determine, it's going to be determined based upon the vigor of that tomato plant. Again, these are recommendations. Your personal experience is going to carry you much further than, than the recommendations we can give. We're not very specific on specific varieties, but again, indeterminate tomatoes usually are pruned up to the second set of flowers. <clears throat> Just a picture depicting how you would uh, go about suckering a tomato or pruning a tomato. Uh, this is a determinate tomato in a high tunnel situation. So we're going to remove all the suckers up to the first flower. You can see the first set of flower clusters there just to the top of, of my hand. And we're going to be pinching off or removing the suckers that form in the leaf axle. Now one of the things I mentioned was we want to make sure we pull these suckers off when they're small. And uh, these are no, by no means small suckers. We like to pull suckers off when they're two to three inches in length. They break off much easier when they're that size. From the size they are here, oftentimes we need to go in with a, a sharp knife or a pair of scissors and cut them off to avoid damaging that tissue in that leaf axle. <clears throat> the arrows point to where the sucker was removed in these instances here. You see we've removed 
three suckers. Arrows are pointing to them. We still have a couple suckers left to remove. Support net, again, this would be for determinants and indeterminants. Uh, with determinants, again, we prune up to the first set of flower clusters. For indeterminants, in the greenhouse or a high tunnel with a single stem, we're going to remove every sucker off that plant. Supporting plants is necessary as well. Uh, sometimes we'll get 20 pounds of tomatoes on a on a plant, so it's going to need some kind of support to to to, to provide uh, support for that plant. Otherwise, it's going to be prostate on the ground. <clears throat> Supporting the plants also uh, keeps them off the ground, keeps them cleaner. As Rick talked about, we can also reduce diseases because we get better. Uh, better movement of air through those plants, which reduces uh, leaf wetness, uh, makes for easier picking as well. And many folks will use cages for, for uh, supporting those plants. The commercial growers will use a method called Florida Weave, which uses tomato stakes and strings to help support those plants. Uh, this is a picture of a high tunnel indeterminate tomato. <clears throat> Again, these are trained to a single sucker, and they're clipped to a string that's attached to a support overhead in the uh, arches of the high tunnel or the greenhouse. Uh, again, those, those suckers or those tomato plants can be up to 15 foot in length, so the special system has been developed to allow those, those plants to maintain their <coughs> integrity in those greenhouses. Here's a determinate tomato being uh, staked in the uh, high tunnel. <coughs> again, this is using the Florida weave method. It's got the uh, twine. Uh, coming out of the bucket that the worker is carrying, attached to a uh, to a T post on the end for support. And every two plants, there's a wooden post that is uh, driven to the ground for support between the end where the T posts are located. We're simply going to place that twine through the plastic PVC pipe. That plastic PVC pipe can be of several different lengths. Uh, the smaller the tomato, the longer the length of PVC, which allows you to uh, wrap it uh, by the tomato and around the stake without having to go to a lot of extra effort. Just just lengthens your hand basically. So we're going to uh, place that string along the outside of the tomato plant <coughs> and loop it around the the uh, wooden stake. And again, we'll repeat that on the other side and we'll place these strings about every six to eight inches along the tomato plant as it grows, thereby giving complete control and support for that tomato plant. You can see on the stake here we have twine on both sides of that plant, or excuse me, both sides of the plant and both sides of the stake. So we're nearing the canopy of that tomato plant uh, and also giving us a, a, an excellent walkway for that plant. So there is a need for staking and pruning of tomatoes. We've covered that here uh, shortly. Uh, there is a, a need for it because it will improve picking conditions. It also helps with disease control as well. And just one plug for high tunnel tomatoes. Uh, the growers I know would much rather grow their tomatoes in a high tunnel simply because it allows them for earlier season and a later season because a high tunnel will provide better growing conditions. You do get more production of number one fruit, which is what you get paid for. Uh, there is very, very little disease pressure in a high tunnel because they're keeping the leaf foliage uh, dry, with the exception of leaf mold, and it seems to be increased in a high tunnel or greenhouse situation. We're also getting more insect problems traditionally in a, in a high tunnel, so be aware of that. As Kyle mentioned, uh, in, in a high tunnel, we're going to be using up to 1,000 gallons of water a week. Uh, make sure you have water on hand for high tunnels, or uh, you're going to be sorry with production. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Deborah Cavanaugh Grant is our next speaker talking about marketing, so I'll turn the program over to her. Thanks, Mike. A fast and furious overview of marketing. And as you can see here, uh, marketing products includes a wide range of activities, such as which product to produce and considerations about how to price, place, and to promote your product. Many of you are aware that uh, we grow tomatoes in every state in the United States. The uh, commercial scale production is highest in about uh, 20 states and as you're probably well aware these two states uh, with the highest production are California and Florida that produce two-thirds of all the U.S. tomatoes. 
Uh, you see with the first bullet point that the U.S. is number two in tomato production. Does anyone have any idea who, what the number one country is for tomato production? Oh, if somebody said Italy. That's a good guess. They probably have the best tomatoes, but China is the number one country in tomato production, and we're number two. I don't know if anyone has uh, read this book, but last summer I, I read this and I thought, uh, you know, just to, to get this perspective as a person that works in local food system. And if you're interested in, uh, it was a very eye-opening book. Obviously, it has a per certain perspective, but about tomato production in the United States, the issues related to um, labor and things like that. So if you're a person who's really interested in tomatoes, I'd suggest that you uh, check this book out. Well, as you're also very aware, there's if we want to talk about types of marketing, we have wholesale marketing, and the picture at the left depicts that, and direct marketing. And this is the person that I buy my tomatoes from in the summer at the farmer's market in Springfield. And you can see here how these are displayed, these nice heirloom tomatoes. Well, what in terms of wholesale marketing, what does that mean? So when you're selling into wholesale markets, you're selling obviously to a type of a brokerage or an auction. And there's a photo up here of the Arthur Produce Auction that's in Arthur, Illinois. So there's opportunities for you as market growers to sell into auctions. If you're thinking about how does this differentiate from the direct sales, you would have less interaction with the customer, but it's a different kind of interaction than if, obviously if you were selling weekly at the farmer's market versus uh, conversations with your wholesaler a couple times a year. The consideration in terms of your marketing strategy is that you're obviously going to get less money per unit income. So if you are a small producer, uh, you may have insufficient volume to, to make the profit that you need to make, and that's a consideration that you'll have to make in your uh, business plan. So direct marketing is selling a product directly to customers. And so one of the things that you're doing is you're thinking about when you're making decisions about direct marketing, especially with tomatoes. There's t tomatoes every everywhere, right? It's the number one vegetable that people grow in their home gardens. People grow them that live in apartments and pots, so there's tomatoes everywhere. You have to think about this if you're going to be a fresh market grower. You know, how are you going to do this in order to make a profit? So. If you're consideration, considering, is there a gap in the market? And as Mike and others have mentioned on the call today, who in growing in high tunnels, there's an opportunity for you in using those systems to be the first person that has tomatoes available. And I don't know about you, but the opportunity to have a real tomato uh, in the, the first time in the, in the summer is something that people are willing to pay a lot of money for. And then secondly, thinking about uh, the tomato varieties that you select or whatever is a niche that's desired by consumers. And these consumers can include people that you would sell to at the farmer's markets and chefs and grocery stores and things like that. So you have to figure out, you know, are heirlooms something that people um, are interested in buying? So that's a, a marketing and obviously a production decision that you need to make. Here's some examples of some direct marketing strategies. Well, community-supported agriculture is a way for farmers to help um, with their cash flow, and there's buy-in from your customers. And so what happens is, is that people are subscribing to your farm. This time of year, people will sign up to be a part of your CSA and will give you money. And in return, during the course of the season, you will provide them with produce every week. There's opportunities for, obviously, selling at farmers' markets. You can sell it directly from your own market at your farm. And in terms of as we're moving into this scale of direct marketing, there's opportunities to sell to direct sales to groceries and also to restaurants. And what are some of the characteristics of direct marketing? It can obviously eliminate the middle person that you're growing this, the tomatoes and selling them directly to the people that are consuming them. And one of the things about it, if you have an entrepreneurial bet, it allows you to see uh, things from the perspective of the consumer. So we use this example of heirloom tomatoes. If you have 
an opportunity to communicate with your customers. Your if they say to you, yes, you know, there's these certain varieties that I like. You know, would you consider growing them? There's there's ways for you then to fill this niche market that people couldn't purchase these types of tomatoes from, let's say, a larger grocery store. As you know, if people that are interested in direct marketing, whether they're consumers shopping at the farmer's markets or chefs buying your product to then serve in their restaurants, this thing about food, it provides an experience. And I think for a lot of uh, recipes and cooking, tomatoes are an integral part of a lot of dishes. And so I think that's something as a tomato grower that this experiencing is, is an important part of uh, why people choose to buy produce uh, in this direct marketing way. People want to connect to the farmers and to these agrarian roots. And then also people want to be able to buy something that they can't get at a grocery store. What are the advantages of direct marketing? Through this uh, direct marketing approach, you're, as the farmer, you can set this price. And so people, I've had farmers tell me in terms of uh, selling tomatoes that they're able sometimes to get $5 a pound for tomatoes, uh, good quality tomatoes. You're going to get feedback from the customers right away telling you what they think about your product. You're going to receive your funds right away, cash sales or immediate payment. And then this idea, you think about the community-supported ag or farmers markets. Many consumers are really vested in wanting local farmers to succeed and seeing their purchases as part of supporting their community. And then it's helping small farms to be profitable. Some of the requirements for direct marketing require your, uh, the personality and the patience to work with people. I've been involved in providing training to beginning farmers for many years, and when you're asking farmers about thinking about their marketing decisions, we, we ask the question sort of jokingly, if you have the patience to work with you know, people on a regular basis. And some people say, you know, I really just don't want to go to the farmer's market every week and deal with that. And so an opportunity then would, would be for you to sell into wholesale markets. When you're thinking about this, you, this, these are small businesses. So all of the things related to starting a small business uh, is something that you need to consider. When you think about eliminating this middle person, so you're the farmer growing the product, selling it directly to the consumer, you have to think about you're taking on new roles. Many people that obviously get into farming, they like to grow things. But when you do this direct marketing, you have to become a person that uh, it has all kinds of skill sets in terms of how you're communicating with the people that you're selling to, all the business management decisions, how are you transporting things, how are you storing them, all of these types of decisions that you have to make and understand that you wouldn't have if you were selling things, you know, growing them on your farm and then selling them to a wholesaler directly, or many of those. So again, you see here you have to deal with marketing, retailing, advertising, regulations. There's a huge amount of things that you have to deal with. The other thing, too, that when you're looking at direct marketing, there's a lot of, obviously, if you're going to add all those other things on there, your hours are extended, and uh, it can cause additional stress. A big thing to consider in your marketing strategy is this thing of how do you set the price for your product? And I would say that this is one of the most important skills that you need to acquire. And when you think about how do you determine the price, you're thinking about two things that you have to balance. The first is establishing this market share, and then you have to determine you know, what's an acceptable rate of return. So as Mike mentioned before, he raises tomatoes in high tunnel systems. If you're the person that can come to the, the farmer's market at the beginning of the year and you're the first person that has tomatoes, you're going to have a lot of people coming to your market stand. And I don't know about you, but I think people when they go to farmer's markets pick farmers or have positive relationships with certain farmers there and their inclination is to go to that market and buy their produce from that farmer. Well, most people, unless they're putting up tomatoes or have some large event, you can only buy so much produce that time. So if you're able to be 
the first person at your market to have this. This can allow you over the course of the season to establish a customer base that may be somebody else who has tomatoes when everybody else has tomatoes it couldn't do the same thing. Uh, key to good pricing is good information. And as you are probably aware, you'll never have all the market information that you would like to have. But you need to be as informed as possible. So some of the things that you should consider are what are the break-even price at various given sales volumes? You need to figure that out. What are your competitors offering and at what price? What are these prevailing market prices? And looking at the quality that you have relative to others that are selling at your farmer's market or in other, your other marketing channels. Heirloom tomatoes are obviously very popular. It's sort of an interesting thing in looking. I think this is a really pretty picture. And you can see the diversity of tomatoes that are out there. But it can sort of be a double-edged sword. And if you go to the market and people aren't familiar with these, so there's a statement on here. It says if it's yellow, orange, or green, and it doesn't look like a conventional tomato, some people are going to be disinclined to buy them. But thinking about that, if you're going to maximize these profits, because there's issues raising heirlooms versus um, non-heirlooms, you need to have a market that's wanting, obviously, to buy these. But then they're, they need to be excited about a regular supply of purchasing them. So the picture that I showed you at the beginning of the slides, that's what uh, Andy grows. Is I mean, all heirloom tomatoes. And um, when people come to the farmer's market there, they know that he has them. He has a wide diversity. And he has a regular customer base of people that this is what they demand. In thinking about this uh, presentation tonight, just talking to Mike, and one of the questions he asked is, how do you market your tomatoes when everyone else is selling them too? And I think because, if you, as we said before, it's the number one vegetable that people raise, especially in beginning farmers, many market gardeners, they obviously all have tomatoes. So what are some of the, the ways that you can be more successful with tomatoes is uh, obviously growing some unique varieties that people don't have. Offering tastings of your tomatoes, because if everybody has tomatoes, there has to be some way that maybe you can get somebody to purchase your tomatoes over your neighbors. And one of the things would be to offer these tastings. The thing that I, I put in here in parentheses is you really have to make sure that you're in compliance with the local health department regulations about what to do in terms of hand washing and all of these kind of things. So before you consider doing that, make sure you understand that. You can do add value to your products. So in terms of making salsas or other things like that, you could do that. Uh, an engaging display is, is it something, too, to do. So how do you differentiate yourself from other people at the farmer's market, let's say, is having a display where people are inclined to come in. And then you can look at uh, selling bulk sales. So at certain times of year, people are uh, processing tomatoes for their own home use and canning and things like that. So there's ways that you can uh, have additional customers by offering bulk sales. And here's some resources I'd like to share. One of uh, the USDA and AMS stands for the Agricultural Marketing Service. And if you go there, you can get daily reports from across the country about prices for various commodities, obviously tomatoes. So it's a great resource. If you are an organic grower, you can look at the organic price re report. And you can, if you just Google or organic price report, you'll be able to find that link later on. And this really great resource that I found from Iowa State University is a publication called Pricing for Profit. And it lays out some really good information about the considerations that you need to make to be successful in marketing. I think for early season warmth with tomatoes, plastic mulch is a preferred mulch. And a dark colored black or red would be preferred over white mulch. The uh, purpose of the mulch is, is, is several. First of all, it, uh, it does warm the soil. If we can get good contact between the black plastic mulch and the soil, it transfers the warmth of the, uh, of the sun to the soil, warms it up, keeps weeds down. Uh, you can it, it prevents evaporation. And it also uh, keeps soil from splashing onto the tomato leaves and to the plants to help keep diseases down and, and also keep fruit clean. 
Organic mulch can be used, uh, straw for instance, or grass clippings, uh, even newspaper for that matter, but the problem with organic mulch is that you're shading the soil to provide for that protection. When you shade the soil, you're going to keep the soil cooler. So for early season growth, organic mulch is going to have a detrimental effect, especially compared to black plastic uh, mulch. We purposely did not provide any rec specific recommendations for tomatoes across Illinois. Now, there are many different types of tomatoes. Uh, they all have their positives and negatives. Uh, the only suggestion I would give is, is to look at the uh, type of tomato, determined or indeterminate, and how you want the production system to evolve based upon the type of tomato. And then look at disease resistance. Uh, uh, we get blossom in rot usually because of uh, fluctuating soil moisture conditions. Uh, it's been dry for so long, and as Kyle talked about, we had that intense rain from Isaac on September 1st, which provided a flush of water to the soil. And if we didn't have the soil moist before that, we saw quite an influx of water, which caused some cracking and so forth. But usually, if we don't have a soil test to, to know that the calcium levels are low and the pH is low, um, blossom end rot is, is a mechanism of, of poor watering technique. So uh, using mulch to reduce, uh, trans reduce evaporation and uh, timely watering and, uh, like Kyle said, uh, constant watering <coughs> will help prevent a lot of blossom and rot problems. Mike and I both have high tunnels. Even the high tunnel producers had some uh, blossom end rot issues this year because, you know, we had such intense heat and, and that uh, the, the plants just lost a lot of water. So it was hard to keep tomatoes in good shape this year. I'll state it again, the tomatoes inside were much better than the tomatoes outside this year, and they have been for many years. Is there a limit you can prune indeterminate tomatoes? No, like uh, like I said, in, in greenhouse situations, uh, greenhouse growers are using indeterminate tomatoes, and they're not allowing a single sucker to form. It's a single stem. So you got a single stem that may be 10, 15 foot in length, uh, going up a, a twine to some uh, canopy, and, in the arches of the high tunnel of the greenhouse with a system that allows that plant to lay down as it goes up to and reaches that uh, top of the uh, top of the structure so that they can go ahead and pick it and take care of it so there is no limit you certainly don't want to you certainly don't want to prune out the apical meristem or the growing point uh, but uh, no uh, again in the turn of tomatoes in, in, in those situations are, are grown as a single single leader system pruning out every uh, sucker. And there, what source of fertilizer for P and K? Uh, for P and K, uh, if you're on a commercial basis, probably DAP. Uh, 18460O is a nitrogen phosphorus source. And 0060 for the uh, potash source, commercial sources. For those growers in uh, <clears throat> who are for fertigating using trickle irrigation, which I think we'd all encourage you all to do, uh, potassium nitrate and calcium nitrate uh, rotated weekly are probably the preferred sources to go through a drip system or an irrig a trickle irrigation system. Uh, those um, potassium nitrate, for instance, is 13 to 15 percent nitrate, nitrate and up to 40, 45 percent potassium. So it has that higher level of potassium that versus nitrogen that tomatoes like. So weekly fertilizations alternating uh, potassium nitrate with calcium nitrate to so the trickle should uh, most growers are satisfied with that program. There was just a question about, you know, city water versus like a private well and what have you. And that's that's one thing if you're going to get into this very seriously, test your water, you know, to know what kind of water you're dealing with. If it's hard, if it's soft, you know, city water, what level of chlorine you're dealing with. Uh, so you can, you know, either filter or treat or do something to that water because uh, it'll have a significant effect on on a lot of the things you're you're going to do with that water and your irrigation. I'm just going to mention uh, in, in a high tunnel situation, if you're using uh, city water, even rural water for that matter, or pond water, you're going to get an accumulation of salts because you don't have the flush through system with rainfall. So uh, in high tunnels, you're going to need to uh, be cautious of, uh, of the, of the salt, excessive salt and how that might impact growth of salt sensitive plants. and uh, just remember that uh, every four or five years you'll need to be replacing the plastic on your tunnel and the recommendation is to do that in the 
late fall of the fourth or fifth years. Okay. Thanks, everybody.